That's, thanks, Dr. Baines. He's told me that I have 12 minutes, so I have to uh, somehow change the context and uh, put 13 years of work into 12 minutes. It's going to be challenging since I have maybe three hours of slides. So the context is, the context is, let's go from Ontario to the world. We're still talking about children, but we're talking about children in the developing world. And we're talking now not so much about technology, but much more about innovation. So that's the context I'd like you to think about. And this is the title that someone wrote for my talk, uh, Pushing Nutrition Paradigms from Lab Edge to 50 Million Children in 10 Years, Addressing an Unresolved Global Problem Through Innovation, Focus, Research, and Partnerships. And I guess I will press these two. So this is the critical pathway to get from an idea to reaching 50 million people. And uh, you can see that there are five components, and each component has a major sub-component in it. And if I had more time, I would actually talk to you about each one of those components, because they are really interesting. But uh, the real issue here is that it is very complex. And although what I'm talking about is a simple concept, putting the concept into practice is not simple. In fact, it's extremely com complex. One has to, first of all, agree on a problem, find a solution to the problem, Initial challenges that I'll talk about very briefly are show that it works, show that people will use it, find distribution systems, find someone who's going to make the product, do things uh, around intellectual property, about regulation, <coughs> to find partners, create demand, creating value chains, ensure sustainability. And then after that, the barriers from going from small pilot studies to scaling up to individual countries, one has to look at government policies and registration, supply and distribution, information, education, communication, integration, and again, IP issues. So again, although the concept is simple, the um, putting the concept into practice is not simple. So here's the simple part. Uh, 10 years ago, the UN identified three remaining problems that had yet been solved in terms of the nutrition of young children. And the three problems were iodine deficiency, causing goiter and major problems similar to congenital hypothyroidism, mental retardation. The second was vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A is an important vitamin that uh, helps fight infection. And the third was iron deficiency. They really solved the first two problems. The problem of iodine deficiency was solved by iodizing salt. And although that sounds like a simple solution, once again, it's not so simple. The problem with vitamin A deficiency was solved in three different ways. One was dietary diversification. They tell people to eat more green and leafy vegetables. Uh, it's solved through fortification, that is putting vitamin A in foods that are commonly eaten, like milk. And supplementation, that is getting children, young children, to take large doses in pills twice a year. So these two problems were by and large solved. The third problem was not so easy to solve, and that was the problem of iron deficiency anemia. And I think you probably can't see this from the back of the room, but on the y-axis is the percentage of preschool children, and the circle is India, and the three bars are 1990, <coughs> 1995, and 2000. And the point of the slide is to show you that not much happened between 1990 and 2000, and the prevalence of iron deficiency anemia in India. Today, India, this high-tech country with everything going for it, 70% of children in India have iron deficiency anemia. Absolutely unacceptable by all standards. So the issue of the iron deficiency remained unresolved. And this is just another picture to show that uh, in 1990, there was a group of world leaders who said, in the next 10 years, we must solve the problem of iron deficiency anemia. And you can see from this slide with the blue arrow on your left, that in 1990, there were over a billion people with iron deficiency. And you can see 10 years later, the number had gone up to about 1.5 billion. So the problem certainly had not been solved. In Canada, we have solved the problem. And we solved the problem to, to a large degree through fortification. This is a slide that I like to show to uh, doctors to say, the question I ask them, so where do children in Canada get their iron from? And the smart ones in the audience said, uh, they get it from meat, fish, and poultry, which are great sources of iron. Not the right answer. Children in Canada get their iron from fortified infant cereals. And the fortified infant cereals are made in the factory, and the fortification takes place in the factory, and all babies go from hopefully breastfeeding to cereals until they go to table food. And the major source of iron for children is in fact in fortified infant cereals. And in Canada, the prevalence of iron deficiency is between five and eight percent, pretty low, except for pockets of First Nations and infants born prematurely. From a developing world perspective, um, there are a number of ways to solve the problem. One of the ways is by using drops, which are commonly used in North America. But the evidence is that there are no universally successful large-scale treatment programs and no countrywide successful preventative programs for infants and young children. The reason is a very simple practical reason. And these are all reasons related to compliance. The drops have a terrible taste, they stain children's teeth black and dark brown, and parents simply won't use them over long periods of time. And for that, le that reason alone, there have been no successful programs anywhere in the world, and the number of individuals have gone from one to one 
1.5 billion. Poor compliance with li li liquid iron supplements because of the strong metallic taste, teeth staining, hard to measure, potential for overdose, and a medical model is hard to sustain over the long period of time. So they simply don't work. In 1990, Six, two individuals, myself and another person, were asked to come to UNICEF's distribution headquarters in Copenhagen. UNICEF had two questions for us. One is, should we, UNICEF, be concerned about iron deficiency anemia? And the second question was, if the answer to the first question is yes, what should we do about it? And they said, your answer has to be based on evidence. So we both came to the same conclusion. We said that the best estimate is that there's probably 750 to 800 million children in the world with iron deficiency anemia. So the good evidence is that this is a major problem. You should do something about it. And UNICEF said, we know that. The second one, again, if they wanted to be based on evidence, we both said the same thing. And that is there are no programs that work anywhere in the world. There's no evidence that any programs anywhere in the world work to combat this problem of iron deficiency anemia. So UNICEF said, that's unacceptable. Go and find out something that works. So, true story, I went back to Toronto, sat in my office and thought, why is it that in Canada we don't have this problem, and in India, Pakistan, Indonesia, many developing countries they do. And the reason quite clearly is that they, children in the developing world don't have access to commercially fortified baby foods. They make them in the home themselves from locally available commodities. So if you live in South India, you make your baby foods from rice. If you live in Northern India, you make them from wheat. But they are locally made commodities. So the idea that I came up with, to make the story slightly shorter, is the idea of home fortification. If we can fortify, if we can fortify foods in the factory, why can't we fortify foods in the home? So the concept was known as home fortification. Came up with an alternate source of iron because if the iron and the liquid taste terrible, how can we get around the taste? The pharmaceutical industry has been using something called taste masking for many years. They simply surround the active molecule with an inert substance and it masks the taste. So I came up with what we call an alternate delivery system and an alternate source of iron, which is a micro-encapsulated iron. Issues that were considered in developing home fortification were that all infants ingest complementary foods, therefore it's a great vehicle for fortification. The definition of a great vehicle for fortification is a vehicle that all babies use, rich and poor, urban and rural. All babies go through a stage between breastfeeding and table food, they eat a mushy food, so it's a great vehicle for fortification. The form is, of iron is important. It has to be a soluble form of iron. The iron should not change the taste or color of the food, of the food into which it's added. And of course, one must consider safety and give just enough, but not too much. So here was the idea of sprinkles, or what we now call micronutrient powders. So the idea is a single serve sachet, a little package, containing a mixture of powdered minerals and vitamins, although initially it was just iron. I realized that if one is going to the trouble of putting iron into a small sachet, it makes sense actually to put other essential nutrients that the babies also need. They can be easily sprinkled onto whatever the food the mother is preparing, and this is very important. It would not work if I said to a mother in southern India, you can no longer use rice to make your baby food, you have to use lentils or wheat or something. It would not work. So the important component here is it can be added to any food that the parent is preparing for their child. And it has to be added to the food without changing the color, taste, or texture of the food. And the uh, sachets look like um, this particular picture. The package is opened up, sprinkled on the food. That's the name, sprinkled. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see some packages from various countries around the world. The cost per sachet is around oh, about one and a half cents per sachet. And just to remind you, the lifetime cost for a child is around two dollars. And considering that when I made the slide, which a couple years ago, you could have coffee for a dollar eighty-five, two dollars doesn't seem to be too much to spend to prevent iron deficiency anemia in infants. The advantages of this delivery concept were it's easy to use, highly acceptable, a food-based rather than a medicinal model, does not require literacy, does not conflict with breastfeeding practices, very important, can be used to promote complementary feeding, lightweight, easy to store and transport, inexpensive and low-tech to manufacture. And this is just an example of two formulations. One has five micronutrients and the other has 16, but don't worry about that. So I went back to UNICEF and I said, I have an idea. My idea is that we'll put powdered minerals and vitamins into a small package, and we will sprinkle the package on whatever food the parents are preparing. UNICEF said, this is a fabulous idea. There's only four things you have to do in order for us to accept this. One is, you have to show that it works, prove efficacy. The second is, you have to prove acceptability. It may work, but most parents won't use it. The third is, you have to get it produced at large volume and low cost. And they reminded me that I had originally told them that there were 750 million children in the world. And if, for example, we're going to use it for 100 days in the first year of life, if you do the math, 100 times 750 million 
is a huge number. So third, get someone to make them a large volume of low cost. And the fourth was come up with some models of successful distribution. So over the next six years, I actually spent my time answering these four questions, which I don't have time to talk, talk to you about now. But first, I show that the iron, when it was micro, micro encapsulated, was well absorbed using stable isotope methodology with funding from CIHR. We then asked the question, how much iron should be put in the sachet? We did randomized control trials, looking at different uh, amounts of iron, 30 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 12.5 milligrams. We then asked the question, how should the iron be delivered? Should it be given every day for two months? Should it be 60 sachets over 90 days, or 60 sachets over 120 days? This is actually a really interesting study. It's true that Dr. Bayes only let me talk about it. <laughs> but it was a great randomized control trial where we gave 60 sachets over 60, 90, and 120 days. And we asked the parents, we said, if you miss a couple of days, it doesn't matter. Again, not the medical model. And the parents said, this really helped a lot. So in this particular model, we found that the children who received the 60 sachets over 120 days had the best response in terms of their hemoglobin change. And if you look at the uh, yellow box, the adherence was 98.2%. So when you give parents the opportunity to miss a day or two, and again, we're talking about nutrition, not medicine, it really made a huge difference, and adherence was really good. When I started this, there was no product. And this is a picture of me in the hospital kitchen. I'll just tell you one quick story. The hospital kitchen, our hospital is an amazing kitchen. We bring things in cold and heat them up, or we bring things in hot and cool them down. But in the kitchen from years ago, we actually have all this equipment that lays there and not working. This, the head chef in our kitchen is a guy named Marcel. And by, I gave Marcel a bottle of scotch every month, and he would let us into the kitchen at night to mix up our sprinkles. True story. So this is an example of how we made our sprinkles for the first couple of uh, years of studies. <laughs> After I realized that this was likely to be successful, we actually had some successful public-private partnerships with companies around the world so that the product could be made close to where it's used. This is a picture of the machine, low-tech machine, so we're talking about technology, and the product is actually made <clears throat> now in many more countries than India, Canada, Guyana, Indonesia, India, and Pakistan. It's made in a number of places now, but these are the first country countries where it was actually made. And it was made there because I went to these companies and I said, I have a great idea. You're going to make money from this eventually, not for a few years, but eventually. And uh, I was right, and they were right to take this on. So remember the four challenges from UNICEF? Show that it works. Show that it's acceptable. So I've shown you that it works, sort of. Showing you that it's acceptable, 98% adherence. The third was get someone to make it large volume, low cost. Six countries, large volume, very low cost. The fourth one was the biggest challenge, and that is developing a sustainable distribution and supply chain. This is absolutely the most difficult. So the issue here is sustainable distribution programs that must be able to reach and provide sprinkles to the most vulnerable populations in countries around the world. And again, I really don't have time to talk to you about this, but this is actually the, the value of supply chain for sprinkles. You can't see this, but really there are upstream and downstream components to this, and each one of these components is actually really important. So although the concept is simple, the application of the concept is anything but simple. Here was the big picture. So the picture, big picture was to do efficacy studies, show that it works, and these were done in multiple countries. I naively thought initially that if we did one great randomized controls trial, that would be adequate. Absolutely wrong. The idea of countries accepting um, something new or individuals accepting something new in different countries, each country said, it may have been fine in Nigeria, but we live in Cote d'Ivoire, and our children are quite different. Not true, of course, but the reason we did similar studies in different countries was because of small, small p politics as opposed to big S science. So the efficacy studies were done in Ghana, Canada, India, China, Pakistan, Vietnam, Bolivia, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. We went on to some effectiveness trials, that is, it worked, but will people use it? We had some fairly large trials in Mongolia, Bolivia, Indonesia, and China, including some consumer research. Based on this, we uh, developed the product. We did some cost-effectiveness studies in Pakistan. We came up with some distribution strategies, and in fact, our strategies for sustainable distribution are finding the right partners. And the right partners, at least for this type of product, are the private sector for production and some market sector distribution. Major UN agencies like UNICEF, the World, Health, World Food Program, and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, both for advocacy and for distribution. Governments, including so ministries of health, usually for advocacy and distribution. We were able to convince seven governments to include the concept of home fortification in their national nutrition policy. And again, the large global NGOs, including World Vision, Save the Children, etc., for distribution. I know I'm nearly done. So let me go to. Uh, some of the pictures, so these are nice pictures, you can see them. So I've talked about iron, but I just want to make the point that in Ghana we include vitamin A in the, in the uh, sachet because vitamin A deficiency is a major problem in Ghana. 
In Mongolia, where vitamin D deficiency rickets is just as big a problem, problem as iron deficiency, we include vitamin D in the formulation to prevent rickets. In Bangladesh, where six out of 10 children have anemia from iron deficiency with arrested development, of course, the sprinkles contain iron. And in zinc, where, uh, sorry, in Pakistan, where zinc has been demonstrated in, in excellent trials to decrease morbidity from diarrhea, pneumonia, and other infections, we include zinc in the formulation, and they're distributed through a huge public program called the Lady Health Worker Program. There are 100,000 lady health workers in Pakistan who do primary care. Phenomenally interesting model that I'd love to talk to you about at some point. The impact today, there have been at least 50 million beneficiaries and children in 26 countries. It's manufactured in more than six countries around the world. Each year, there are at least 300 million sachets being produced. We have used three different models of distribution, at least public sector, UN sector, and subsidized private sector distribution. Seven countries have included in the national policy for nutrition. And the impact is a 40 to 50% reduction in the prevalence of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. This has been a major collaborative program, and some of the collaborators are listed on this slide. And finally, uh, just a quote from the World Bank to say that probably no other technology available today offers as large an opportunity to improve and accelerate development at such a low cost in such a short period of time.